Hi, everybody. Welcome once again to the Stevie B Show. As always, I'm Stevie B. Well, I am so excited to have my guest here today. She's an actress. She's a TV host. And uh, we met a few years ago. Please say hello to Andy Sweeney Blanco. Andy, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. No, thank you so much for having me, Steve. Yes. It's I great to wanna, see you again. It's great to see you again. It's, yeah. been, it's been years. I mean, uh, like seven, eight years. years. I mean, yeah. we actually, I want to mention that uh, Andy and I met, we did a, a, a film project in Winthrop, Massachusetts, and yes. uh, we had a lot, a lot of fun doing it. In fact, mm -hmm. we have a picture of me and you, if we can show that picture. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. We're going to see little Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, there we are. Uh, oh, my look, goodness. You are, uh, look, you, oh, man, that, that, that I like was a in baby. a, you know, oh, my God, you were, yeah, that we had such a fun time doing that. I mean, that was yeah. such a fun time, you know. And you are so photogenic, too, and it's just amazing. Oh, no, that's, you're way too kind. <laughs> I hate no kind. I'm just glad you're in the picture as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that was a 48-hour film festival, That's right. right. Uh, and I remember. Th that, and our friend uh, Lisa Divascovi uh, was yes. in charge of it, too. And we mm -hmm. had a lot of fun doing this. It. It's a lot of pressure to do a 48-hour film because, you know, like you, yeah. you get the project on Friday. Saturday, you're filming, and then Sunday, you have to edit. So it yeah. took a while. And. And uh, the movie was—I think the movie was called Ice. I think uh, yes. I don't know, but it, I think it was, was a was a it was. yeah, it was a it was a fun show to do. Yeah. So I mean, but uh, but after that like we I know I know it was a while. after a while. I mean, this was back in 2016. We we lost contact for a while. So Andy, tell me, um, tell us a little about yourself growing up. Now you you said you mm -hmm. you're actually originally from Mexico. Yeah, I was born and raised in Monterrey, Nuevo León, uh, which is northeast of Mexico City. My mom's actually from Mexico City, so Spanish was my first language. Um, and then when we moved, I moved around a lot growing up. So once we moved to the States, I learned English. And luckily, I, I already wanted to be an actor. So I had been studying different accents and dialects and languages and cultures uh, from a very, very young age. Um, and so I kind of wanted to make sure I never got pegged into a specific uh, role um, so that I could just chameleon myself into whatever. So that helped with actually learning the American accent <laughs> and blending in, if you mm. will. Now, so. when did you first come to this country? Uh, it was a while ago now. I mean, I was, I think, 10 years old at the time. So when I was 10, uh, we and it was a big shift, of course, culturally and uh, learning a new language. And actually, I guess because of how the school systems were different in Mexico and here, I ended up skipping a grade. I, th I skipped third grade, I think. So then I went straight to fourth. So I was the youngest as well. So that was that was a bit of a hard experience. But actually, I had my dad's side of the family is from the States. So I, you know, I had the American side already um, built in in Boston, actually. So oh. I Boston is the only place that I have been that has been consistent throughout my life because I moved around a lot, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. growing up. So uh, but every summer we would always come visit Boston. And so uh, it held a special place in my heart. And I think that's why I ended up coming to college here um, and wanted to and lived here for four years. I went to Emerson now College, you, as you know. Emerson, mm -hmm. Emerson's a great school. You always mm -hmm. wanted to be an actress when you were a little girl? Yeah, I was really lucky that when, uh, when I was in elementary school, maybe it was kindergarten, I, I don't remember... I think I was five or six, but there was a touring theater company that came uh, to my town, and they were doing the play of Anastasia, and they um, needed a young Anastasia. So because I went to, it's very common in Mexico to have like all girls and all boys schools, um, mm -hmm. especially the elementary schools. So they came to my all girls school and um, basically. Ca did a casting and um i don't i mean i think i was dancing and singing before i could talk i would like i would do like i would do this i guess yeah. to my parents whenever i wanted them to play music as a baby yeah. so for me like i would just be mesmerized by movies and the theater and everything mm. um I, you know i'd be even though i was little i would just be zoned in you know i wouldn't get distracted whenever there was a movie on or something and um so i think it called to me even before but then when they did this casting i actually i guess i, I got cast as anastasia <laughs> and <laughs> and then did the show and got to go into a recording studio beforehand because they would record the songs just in case because i was so young um and i fell in love with 
with the theater and the experience of of playing make believe at the time I was mm-hmm. you know you do that I think naturally as a kid mm-hmm. um, when you're uh, imagining games and situations with your friends it's basically the same thing but I got to be on a stage and with the lights you don't see the audience so it was really like creating this space where imagination ruled and I think Mm -hmm. that influenced me going forward what uh, can you tell us like what roles you've played on stage yeah I mean I um man I think theater's the number one in my heart I think that's it's I'm a theater guy too yeah yeah and uh well it's I think it's the best formation for any actor if you want Mm -hmm. to if you're serious about becoming an actor even if it's in film uh or television I think the formation starts uh in theater and on the stage uh, just in terms of the process of being an actor but in terms of roles that I've played, um, I mean, I, I've been Annie. Uh, I did Susical um, in, in in L.A. mostly at the San Gabriel Civic and uh, the Colony Theater, uh, which are local. Uh, actually, but I did do a professional production in Priscilla Beach Theater here. I played um, Roxy in Chicago. Oh, and I can picture you as Roxy. That Definitely. was so much fun. Oh, man. I actually did Chicago. I was Amos Hart back in yeah. back in 2011 Look at that. Uh, mr <laughs> cellophane right here <laughs> Aww, i can see you ro- rocking that That'd i know so great. i know now yeah. how did when you when you came to this country like and you mm-hmm. went to emerson mm-hmm. like what what uh, what are some of some of the projects that you were able to audition for and what what, what did you star in if, if you don't mind me asking yeah so so funny i don't I haven't talked about my my credits in a while. Um, I uh, yeah. I, so I came to this country, and then obviously I grew up in uh, San Diego, LA, different parts of California. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I was uh, college age, then I came to Emerson. So I did get some time in, in the states before I went to college. But um, I was very lucky too because uh, for high school and for Emerson, I was lucky to have a scholarship, mm-hmm. um, which allowed me to you know, still work three jobs while I was in college. Mm-hmm. And, um, were you like a waitress? Like, well, so many actresses I say, it's inspiring actually that no, never I act actually, waitresses. On purpose, I never became a waitress because I thought it's such a stereotype to be an actor waiting. But, um, I think it is a very smart idea because you do make a good living while you're pushing for your dreams being, mm-hmm. a being a waiter. Um, but I did host for a little bit at a, it was on Washington Street, a re- an Italian restaurant there in, mm-hmm. near the Paramount Theater. Um, I was also a nanny, and I worked front desk as a host at Equinox. Um, and I'm very proud of those jobs because Equinox allowed me to maintain a focus on health and fitness um, mm-hmm. and learn a lot from my trainer friends and also from people watching from everyone that would come in as a, as a member. I would engage with them. And I think... Even then, I knew it was great training for those um, improvised conversations and also, you know, when you get an upset customer or something and the way that you handle that Mm. um, and handle yourself and learn to gauge your levels of emotion and patience. And, I mean, any day job should be so respected. Even, you know, if someone's an actor and you see them waiting tables or they are... They are getting, you know, anything that is people-based, that is that is great training, I think, for an actor. And um, certainly helped me in my hosting career as I had, uh, oh, and I had the radio show at WRS, so I hosted Standing Room Only for um, three years uh, at Emerson, which was oh. amazing. You, uh, we have a friend of ours, uh, John Joseph Fahey, you were um, yes. actually, you were actually on his show. Um, yes. Last night, so do it like, Seven years ago, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as well. Very nice man. We, we yeah. talked about, uh, the sag after thing and everything like that. Oh, yeah. You've worked in LA. You, you've, um, like yeah. what, what, what can you ask? Like what sh- TV shows or movies you've been in that we may know about? Yeah. Um, well, I the, my last movie that I did was um, two years ago, which was Evil at the Door. And COVID had just hit um, in March. And then this was the first feature film that got approved by SAG to shoot in L.A. once the pandemic had started. Uh, and we shot early August because, or it was one of the first, um, and it was because... Um, 
we were quarantined. We shot at the Frank Sinatra house, uh, where one of the houses he used the Frank to have. Sin- oh, wow. Yeah, oh, in wow. LA. Yeah, and I think it was Woodland Hills where it's at. But So we shot there, and it's such a big house that we uh, were all quarantined within it. So we weren't allowed to leave set, but that meant that we could shoot the movie, and we had to condense the days um, to seven days of shooting which is a crazy challenge for a feature film. Um, we shoot seven days straight? That- we shot seven days straight because because of all the risks having to do with the pandemic mm. and there was still a lot that people didn't know, but the industry was largely shut down, so there was very little work. And so mm. all these conditions had to be in place. Um, I know. What I got laid off us. from my job because of COVID oh. as well, a lot of things. But I'm back now. But I'm so sorry. It, Good, yeah. We're, we're, we're back now. Slowly but it, getting it, back. Yeah. But. And uh, so um, what, what we're going to do is um, we're going to show uh, your theatrical reel. Mm-hmm. And we're going to take a look at it and see some of the parts you've played in film and all sorts of things. Do you, do you mind if we take a look at it? Um, sure. I don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at Andy's uh, Andy Sweeney Blanco's theatrical reel. What are you doing? I'm trying to get this thing to work. I'm in contact with, with who? Whoever's out there. This phone is an obsession. Disease the old world. Why am I letting it go? Embrace this world, not the lost one. Yeah, not ready yet, thanks. Come on, Mom. Let's go inside. It's cold. Mom needs to have your honey. My father trusted you. We we all trusted you. We need to control. Where is he? Where where they take him? No, he didn't get out. Help. So I have everything ready to go on the Senator Mary story? Good. Leave it with Dan. He'll be running the piece. Uh, this is my piece. I've been working on it for months. Did I stutter? No. Um, I just, I, uh, I don't understand. I think you'll find the world still spins, whether you understand or not. Why did you hire me if you didn't think I would deserve to be here? If you want your work published, this is how it goes. Thank you for the opportunity. I've learned a lot. i ask you this one thing. I, I, get, I get this a lot. I mean, I've had so many people in my life, you know, when I mm-hmm. said I wanted to be an actor, you know, they used to tell me, you know, give it up. You're never going to make it. You're mm-hmm. wasting your time. And I'm used to rejection because, I, like I said, I, I, I've been to so many auditions. Oh. But, but I'm just saying, I guess the question is, me like, too. <laughs> how do you, what do you tell the people who, who want to do this for a living but are get constantly rejected? How do you, like, pick them up? How do you, like... Keep, keep, how do they, you know, keep pushing? What would you what advice be to people who want to continue doing this, even though they get really turned down so many times? Do you have any advice? Yeah, I mean, I think that you are your own best cheerleader. Um, I think the people that have told you, you know, oh, uh, you're never going to do this or that, that's their projection of the world on you. That tells you more about them then it should tell you about yourself mm-hmm. um, because you we have control over how we see the world over our thoughts i think we do create our reality you know our, our perspective is self-made um, and now obviously there's influences like how your parents spoke to you and raised you and if you were supported or not but you know sometimes when you have those voices in your life you can use them as fuel to prove them wrong I certainly have had my own share of of people saying things like that to me in in high school or um or college I mean it you know oh you're doing too much or um oh you know no you should stick to what you know you know because I actually branched out of acting and started doing producing and directing as well Mm -hmm. and I love when people say that to me because then I go okay um I don't you know you don't have to fight back you don't have to tell them well I'm gonna prove no you just silently go oh thank you for your perspective then you go home and you do it and it's fantastic you know it might take years too I mean it 
but it is your own dream. I think realizing too, the world doesn't owe you anything. It, the world is too busy taking care of itself is a really big deal too. So people will work really hard towards something that they want. And then, you know, maybe it takes years of struggle. It certainly took me so many, I was very lucky to have found this very young because for years I have fought to be a regularly working, you know, I'm at that point now where I, I'm a TV host and I, I only do what I love for a living, which is such a privilege. But it took from the age of six to now I'm in my mid twenties. And, um, and it took all of those years to find the way in. Cause I wasn't born into a family that was in the industry. I wasn't, mm -hmm. I didn't have copious amounts of money. I didn't, you know, it, it was, it was one of those things where it was, just to go back to your question of do you have any advice, focus on how to, not on the why not, right? So focus on the what you want, not on the how. I, I really learned this in a powerful way uh, when COVID hit, actually, I took my car from LA to Boston because I quarantined in it. And I was like, I'm just, I want to be out in nature. I want to meditate and, and create the reality that I want. And, you know, now that it feels like there's a lot of things we can't control in the world and mm -hmm. everybody's uncertain and everybody's worried. Um, I wanted to focus on what my dream was, but allow myself to also listen to the doors that were opening or the windows that were opening and be equally as receptive to that. So then I was a co-creator of my reality with the universe as opposed to being, you know, a passenger in terms mm -hmm. of, oh, I'm a victim of everything that happens to me or trying to have so much control over everything that is impossible to have because things are going to happen like, you know, global catastrophes or pandemics or, um, you know, uh, just not getting a role in a specific project. But, um, but if you have that middle ground of like, okay, I, I know what I want, but I don't know how it's going to come to me. So you're equally listening as you are dreaming. And I think that's the magic element or the magic sauce to uh, creating a life that it surprises even you. I love that idea of like, I thought I wanted to be this huge, famous Broadway star and movie star, but now I've gotten to travel the world with this docuseries, meet people from different communities and use ho my hobbies as my job. So I'm on this TV show. Yeah. So now you're in a docudrama called mm -hmm. The Fixers. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how did you end up getting uh, involved in this project? Yeah. It, it was, I mean, I don't know how much time we have, but I have plenty of time. I, um, I, it was a really amazing experience, both personally and, uh, and professionally. So, um, if, if, you know, just to condense the story into a smaller amount of time, um, I was in Mexico, living in Mexico, I'd just in a couple of telenovelas, uh, down there. Um, and I was loving being back in my country and reconnecting with my culture, uh, and then I get a call from my agent and he says, I've had a project come in that I think is perfect for you, but it veers away from scripted narratives. And it's actually a, like a reality show. It's, it's a docu-series um, that travels the world. And I thought, wow, okay. Because as soon as he said reality or docu-series, I went, okay, now that's outside my, you know, my field. But he said, just trust me on this. So I go, okay. I, I'm gonna, it's good to trust your reps because I, I love my reps. They're, my team is just incredible. It took so long to find them, but, um, but you know, it's one of those things where I go, okay, you know, they know me really well, they know what they're doing. So I, I kind of trusted them and they, they were so secretive about what the show was because it had already come out. I actually joined on season three. So I was a new addition to the team. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so he just calls me and he goes, okay, so you have a construction background, right? You said, and I went, I mean, yeah, carpentry is a hobby. And I'd done a lot of volunteer work. It, volunteering is such a big uh, and important thing for me growing up. It was especially in high school. I think it just keeps you grounded and aware of mm -hmm. different re you know, realities. Mm -hmm. And um, I volunteered a lot with um, a center for um, kids, foster care kids, and I was mm -hmm. a tutor there. And then I did oh, uh, some projects like Habitat for Humanity. Oh, and Jimmy Carter, he's the former president, he's, he's with Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, isn't he? Yes, yeah. I think so. That's and then, a great organization. So basically really you, you build houses for 
low-income families is that how it was yeah that how it? and different projects too there was also a christian appellation project that i did where we went out into the mountains and either um uh, fixed dilapidated houses or we built them from the ground up for families that didn't have any way to to do that um and and it was very rewarding and also involved a hobby of mine which is carpentry <laughs> which no one ever guessed and actually a lot of friends of mine didn't even know that was something that i like to do on the mm. side um and so so, but I had told my agent at some point or put it on my special skills at the bottom of the resume or something. Um, so he obviously being as amazing as I, Paul Murphy as my agent in LA, um, as he is, he had read that and seen that and said, you know what, I know how big you are on volunteering. And this show mixes everything that you love travel. Cause I'm, I was always on the road, still am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and connecting with people and communities and, and doing these build projects for them so what the show is it turns out then after i auditioned also okay i have to go into this story because i think it's hilarious go right ahead i want to hear it <laughs> i want to hear it so i i had as i as i mentioned i just finished these telenovelas and they had put for one of the roles i played these really long fake nails on <laughs> which if you've ever had fake acrylic nails they are impossible to get off unless you rip your real nail off. So it's like Ooh. I couldn't get them off. And it, and they're, you know, really hard. So I was like, eh. So I just went to the audition with these long <laughs> nails. And they I just... once saw someone with the long nails like that. They were typing. And I'm like, how do, how you, do you type? Do that? How do yeah. you type? Yeah. So I, you know, I went in and uh, they said they were going to have me build something, but they didn't tell me when. So I went in and then they're like, okay, we just want you to build a box. Well, we ask you questions, and I thought, okay, that should be easy enough. And then I go in, and there's all these different kinds of wood, and it's really thick wood. And I had to find all of the equipment that I was going to use, and they have all the saws available. But um, at the time, I hadn't used some of them in years, and so I was, you know, and I had my nails, and I had, I was dressed kind of nice, and I thought, oh, I didn't, I wasn't. That's this is going to be harder than I thought. And I was like, I just trusted it. But I went in, and um, and then they started asking me very profound questions about you know oh so you know what do you believe is the most important thing in life or oh and you know things that that require thought and introspection and and at the same time i'm trying to build this box so it was like one of those oh, things yeah. where you're trying to you do walk and chew gum at the same time in a way <laughs> yeah right right and mm -hmm. um so it, it was interesting but it was fun i mean i thought okay you know what again going back to as an actor your job is to audition. It's not to get the job. So just have a great time and be really present mm -hmm. in the moment. And so I thought, you know what? I'm already here. I'm just going to... I had flown from Mexico to L.A. to do the audition. Mm -hmm. And... I, uh, and I'm with my long nails using the, the jigsaw <laughs> and at one point, and I could see the director being like a little puzzled <laughs> by, by the fact that, that this was happening. And I, and inwardly I was like, what, a, what timing, you know, what funny timing. But at the same time I had, after I got the job, so first of all, I was, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get the, the, the timeline right because I haven't told this story in a while. So after I did my audition, I walked out and I called my agent. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get this one. I I had long nails and I, you know, messed up and I I don't even know what I said in the interviews. <laughs> you know? And um, But it turns out that, you know, as is historically true throughout Hollywood, some of the best performances um, on TV uh the actor actually did the same thing. They called their agent, told them, I'm not going to get this one. And then they end up booking the role. You know, there was um, in Glee, the, the, the girl who plays Rachel, um, mm -hmm. Leah Michelle. Leah Michelle, yeah. She, yeah, she, she did the same thing. She thought they had hated her. In the, but she was so in, in the part that all the little mishaps that she perceived as mistakes, um, but played them off, right, mm -hmm. were actually real moments that the casting directors just and, and the creators of the show were drawn to and they loved right and the same thing with um oh his name's escaping from breaking bad the um i have to be honest i've never seen breaking you've bad. never se <gasps> i'm sorry i'm uh, oh. i know people will keep saying uh, there are that so many shows uh, oh well, uh, i'm i offended you i'm sorry <laughs> I, yeah. I just never you know i there's so many good shows on that i there can't see uh, but yeah. i like uh Brian Cranston. You yes, know, he's he, amazing. He's great. In everything he, he's ever yeah, done. Yeah, he's incredible. In well, the, the other guy, the, the, the one that plays his Bob accomplice. Bob Odenkirk? Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, the young guy, right? He's yeah, yes. I, yeah. Yeah, so he same thing. When he auditioned, he went up on his lines. He forgot the script and started just improving and then he had this long silence and then it go, it came back to him and he kept going. So he never dropped it or apologized. He just kept it going and he booked the role but he thought I probably looked so unprofessional. You know, it's that the yeah. inward thinking and so anyway, it was funny. I had my own moment like that and it turns out I, I booked the show. It turns you out whatever I part. said. Yeah. You got the part. <laughs> but it we, you know when when it's another testament to when something is meant for you, there's no way that you can mess up that that situation, you know, unless you don't do the work. If you just sit back and say, you know, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to go for it because mm. this or that, um, you know, we're our own worst critics. And unless you don't do anything, if you take action, you will get somewhere. And you, it might not be where you originally thought it would be. It's probably going to be even better because it's going to be what was intended for you. And this show, I could have never imagined for myself. But I did find a... And I wish I'd sent in a picture. I'm just thinking about this now, so I didn't think to send it. But I did find a sticky note that I wrote. So I, I'm big on post-it notes. I love them. I mm -hmm. put them all over my books and I... Did you invent them? Was it Romy Michelle's I know, I wish. No. I invented post I, I did not. I don't get any stock uh, in them and I don't have any commissions mm -hmm. from post-its. Every time I someone just... says post-it, I always think of that movie. I don't know. Oh, I invented yeah. post-its. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I love that reference. That's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. I don't use it. Mm -hmm. um, I know, but I love them because they're very visual. So you can write a post-it and you can put it on your mirror and then you remember mm -hmm. it. And I, I do... Uh, I started the system actually in that same drive from LA to Boston. Mm -hmm. I um, I came up with the system for myself of writing very specific visions that I had for myself and putting them up that were very specific on the what I wanted, but not the how. So going back to the what, not the how. And I wrote three that first year that I drove to from LA to Boston. And I kid you not, I wrote three. They all came true in order and within that year. So all What'd of them. What they say. Mm -hmm. um, this was in 2020, and the, the first one was before the end of the year. So everyone was saying there wasn't going to be any acting work for two more years. And I thought, oh, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to imagine something different. So I said, okay, before the end of the year, I will book a role, a dynamic role in a feature film that challenges me physically and allows me to do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. um, I kid you not, <laughs> a week and a half later, I get a call from a producer I'd worked with years before. I wasn't even working with him as an actor. I was working with him as a first AD. Apparently, he'd found my acting reel online. And at the time, I had a horror reel. Not the one we played today, but I had a horror reel up online of all the horror projects I'd done. And, uh, and he saw it, and he calls me, and he goes... You never told me. First of all, no. He goes. First of all, you're in trouble. I'm like, why am I in trouble? And he goes, you never told me you're a good actress. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, in fact, you never told me you were an actress at all. Because I was, I think I was first AD on that movie mm -hmm. that we did. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I might have been line. Pro no, I was first AD. Um, I'd done a lot of crew positions as well, which is great as an actor, so you can understand how a set works. But um, so he calls me and he goes, well. I have a role that's come up that I think would be great for you, but I want to forewarn you that it would be a bit physically challenging and I would want you to do a lot of research because it's an ex-drug addict and I need you to have the terminology down. <laughs> and I oh. thought, and I, and, then I, and I heard those words and I looked in my mirror, I'm like, no. <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, if you could put a self tape together and send this in, this, that would be great. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Mm. And so, you know, I, I took, I, I read the script and I taped for it and then, Two days later, I get a call. So the second post-it note went, before the end of the year, I will book. So I still hadn't done any television work other than a co-star, which is usually a one line mm -hmm. uh, that you say or, or even mm -hmm. just, you know, are just featured. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted a, the next thing up. I said, okay, before the end of the year, I want a guest uh, a guest role, a guest star role, which is when the episode is about you or you have a leading character, mm -hmm. even if yeah. it's just in one episode, and then you have recurring, which is when you're in the series yeah. as a whole, right? So as a guest star, um, so I said, before the end of the year, I will book a guest star in a TV series that is a lot of fun and that allows me to travel and feel uh, beautiful or something like that. Yeah. Um, but that was the wording. It was very specific, 
and yet open-ended as to how, right? And mm-hmm. so uh, two days later, I get a call from Televisa in Mexico because um, I had gone a year before. There was in a pandemic at the time. I'd gone a year before to leave my resume at different casting offices at the um, studios and heard nothing back. No one. <laughs> it just so happened that the role had come up for me and uh, it was a guest star in one of the episodes. Actually, no, it was in two episodes of the series. Now, and this was a telenovela, right? This was a telenovela. Uh-huh. And that's actually what brought me to live in Mexico and why I was living there when I got this TV show. But um, And then the third one was before the end of the year, I will sign uh, with an agency that is small but focused and that I, I love and that will get on the phone and pitch me for things and um, and be my teammate, right, And in this process. And sure enough... Uh, months later in December, right before the year ended, I found my current agent right now, which is exactly that. It's a boutique agency. And he gets on the phone and he talks to people about, you know, what I do at best. And that's, I I have wanted that all of my life. It's really hard to find. Um, That's amazing. All, everything you wrote down came true. It did. And I, but I don't, you know, and I think that the secret was, and not that it's a secret, it's probably, you know, so obvious that the universe tries to tell us these things. But mm-hmm. um, and when I say the universe, you know, I, I, I leave it open ended, but you can call it God or you can call it, um, you know, mm-hmm. nature or, or mm-hmm. you know, our own energy and, and bringing reflecting back what we um, perceive in the world. Mm-hmm. But I think because I wrote these visions from a place of joy um, and a place of saying, I don't need these things. I'm not trying to draw this from other people or feel like I deserve anything. Instead, I I am giving a vision out there and I'm letting it come to me in whatever form it appears. And I think that that was what I'm that's what I mean when I say that co-creating with the universe, being kind of using your gifts and using your imagination while also being open to whatever challenges or whatever opportunities come your way and not judging them ahead of time mm-hmm. when you're kind of open to that I think that's when the magic happens so I wrote them from a place of I'm already inwardly okay I went from LA to Boston I drove in that trip I did a lot of praying a lot of meditation a lot of connecting with nature and reflecting on what do I really want out of life there's a pandemic right now everybody feels like they don't have control over what could happen so how can I feel okay while I feel outside of control right Mm -hmm. and that's that that was the magic that, that, that was amazing to me because I got to experience this magical thing while also having been part in its in the vision of it or the creation. Yeah. Um, and then the following year, which was 2021, this year, I wrote one and I forgot that I wrote it. And then after booking this TV show, this docuseries, I, uh, looked, I found it among papers that I had because I didn't put it up in my mirror because I was traveling by that point. I was in Mexico and I'm moving around from Airbnbs to, until I found an apartment. And, um, and it said, uh, this year, meaning 2020, it was April, 2021 that I wrote it. And I said, this year I booked my first ever recurring role in a TV show that aligns with my values, love of travel and human exploration. And that was the fixers. Well, I didn't know it was the fixers at the time, but I was actually thinking it was a recurring role in a narrative, like a what I'd mm-hmm. traditionally done. Mm-hmm. But then I booked the fixers and I looked at the post-it note and sure enough, I mean, everything that I had written down is what this show is. I mean, it's my job within the show is I host the show, but I'm also a carpenter. I'm doing the building and the the, the construction within mm. the show. It really is us doing it. And my three co-hosts, amazing, uh, Courtney Dober, uh, Nick Apostolidis, and Kieran Stone. Mm. Um, they're my co-hosts and then myself. And we all have different skill sets that we bring to the table. Everyone can do a little bit of everything, but... Yeah. Um, we want to show uh, some footage of uh, the fixers. Well, if, yeah. If it's all right with you. And uh, just now, what, what are what are some of the countries you've gone to doing the show? Yeah. Um, so there's 10 episodes, and each episode is either in a different country or a different location. So um, we did, I believe, three episodes within the United States, which mm-hmm. was uh, in, one in Virginia, one in Navajo Nation, which is actually 
supposed to be considered a sovereign nation, but of course it it's within uh, four states. I think Arizona, Nevada, uh, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, and New Mexico. No, oh. not maybe not Utah. I don't know. Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico. That you know where those four the four oh, states there's are. There's a part in which the four states connect ones that like. Yeah, the, I, I know what you're talking. We about. We were in the New Mexico, Arizona. Mm -hmm. spot um and so but it's yeah it's considered its own place we actually couldn't even stay within uh navajo nation because it, you can't stay there overnight if you're not navajo so um so yeah so it was navajo nation virginia and texas that we did oh. within the states and then internationally we went to guatemala uh kenya portugal um the uk we did one uh, in leeds close to manchester wow um and Zambia, also in Africa, mm -hmm. and I think I'm. You said oh, in Suriname. Where, Suriname was my favorite. <laughs> where, where, where is Suriname for people who don't know? Yeah, you know, actually, none of, none of us knew. We'd never heard of it when we when the production came to us and said we're thinking of doing this place next. Um, but it's the smallest country in South America. It borders Brazil, and it is incredible. It is so beautiful. Um, not only just in aesthetic, like, you know, it's, it's basically the jungle, mm -hmm. but uh, they have such an incredible amount of diversity and, um, and it's a Dutch settlement. So actually it's in South America, but everybody either speaks Dutch or indigenous languages. So mm -hmm. my Spanish didn't help me at all there. Oh, that's <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, but, but it does, it borders Brazil and it's, it's really cool. It's primarily a Christian uh, country, but um, they've held on to... Uh, their indigenous traditions mm -hmm. and and languages. So it's a beautiful mixture of of faith and coexisting. You know, you can see these families, and you w wouldn't believe that they're related to each other. And because you know, there's someone that looks more you know Asian or black or um, or indigenous or you know, and, and so there's all these different representations. So it's within, kind of like a melting pot. In it a is a melting pot in, within the community, and so. You know, there is, as far as we, as far as what we spoke to the communities about, they said, yeah, there's no prejudice here. Everybody's family. It's a country about love. And actually, I know there's a clip I sent in uh, yeah. of Suriname, so maybe yeah, we can we're look gonna at that we're one. gonna take a look at these clips right now. Yeah. This is um, the uh, Discovery Plus uh, show and the BYU TV. Yeah. And you, um, what's it called again? So it's the Fixers, and um, it's from BYU TV. Um, which is a nonprofit, and they're based in Utah, and it's also, I believe, on Discovery International. Discovery International. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a look at it. Mm -hmm. Here is the Fixers. Four expert builders have been given ten weeks to travel the world and change the lives of ten communities in need. With no time to plan, this resourceful team will need to bring the community together to do the impossible. Their mission to forge a better future, one project at a time. Next on The Fixers, we travel to the tiny but exotic country of Suriname. This country is just like all about love. Pure love. Yes, pure love. We're here to build a factory that will create jobs. The main problem is, this is the tail end of monsoon season. It's chaos in here. It feels like this project might be out to get us. Some little mistakes sometimes make you bleed. I don't know how it just went south so quick. I'm usually quite optimistic, but this one is, is hurting my soul a little bit. On a regular build, something like this should take about two months. It doesn't change the fact that we came here to do a job. I think this could be the first build in Fixers history where we don't finish. Honest truth. Next on The Fixers. A small village in Costa Rica needs our help as the women of the village are struggling. Low wage jobs, little opportunity. Siempre vas a encontrar alguien que te diga, y principalmente el hombre, no estás para eso, pues es demasiado difícil. And we are here to change that. Quiero que sea, se haga grande para yo pueda ayudar a personas con discapacidad igual que yo. One of the most inspirational people I've ever met. I've never heard a story like that. But it's not going to be easy. We are getting beat up on this job. What's happening over there? 
I have two days to finish this kitchen. He's in the mud. Let's just put it that way. It's not looking good. Uh, <laughs> Coming up on The Fixers. Hello, Kenya. A school and orphanage in Kenya needs a major upgrade to its tiny farm. The school needs a better protein source for their students, and they want to use the farm as an agricultural training center. Swahili. And we're going to do it big. And mind you, this is the first building we've ever done and are attempting to put a second story on it. It's a magical place run by an inspiring woman named Daisy. Nothing is impossible. I don't believe in impossibilities. This is the story of a little orphan girl who came from nothing. I wanted to be that mother to those that do not have. And change the lives of so many. Daisy, who's taken everything that she's gone through in her life, made sure that they have some kind of faith and hope in the future. And that's something that no one can ever take away from them. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. The way you guys are walking, it's kind of like the right stuff. Oh, my gosh. That. <laughs> that was so much fun. We yeah. felt so funny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the wind was blowing in just the right direction, and you're just like, all right, this is my Indiana Jones moment. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you had the the hat, too, and everything. Is that uh, yeah. That's the... And actually, you can check out you the fixers out... for free. Um, if you go to byutv.org slash the fixers, mm -hmm. you can watch any of the 10 episodes. So. That, that that's that's amazing. I mean, yeah. that, 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 I mean, <laughs> you must it must give you a lot of joy, you know, to help these people with you know housing and uh, building mm -hmm. these homes and everything. Well, it's amazing because um, I think it's really important whenever you go somewhere, even if you have the intention of helping and doing good, that you are focused on learning as much from whatever community or place that you're going to as much as you are focused on giving. So our intention is to go do a build project for a community in need that needs a specific thing to prosper or thrive or that's going to change lives in some way. But they're changing our lives as we are there with them as well because not only are we learning building techniques from that area um, but we are also connecting with the community learning about their stories learning about their culture their ways of life um, and it gives one a lot of food for thought a lot of reflection and perspective on our lives and we are changed in the process and so the show it's very much about the build project and the challenges of doing that it's also crazy how we are doing a whole build project and they're big construction projects mm -hmm. um in just six days so that's the big challenge of it and we really do get it done in six to seven days of course it takes a lot of planning and design work and everything as as a team um and then we have amazing local volunteers that show up especially because you know it's a community effort and they know that this is something that they want to be a part of and so we have the privilege of getting to meet people from all over the area that are coming in to volunteer help with this build project um planning in advance allows us to keep our schedule pretty um mm -hmm. much where you know where it should be mm -hmm. but sometimes like in that clip in Suriname, we do run up against the clock because you know we were out in the middle of uh, jungle <laughs> and um, it was really hard anything that we needed if, if we got the wrong materials uh, brought into us or anything happened like that we had two hours at least of waiting time to get the right things in and and everything mm -hmm. and so that that put us uh, up against some challenging and we were running on fumes by the end because we were staying till you know we're working from we're getting up at 5 30 in the morning every it day it must be like exhausting not only physically but mentally to do a show time. like that isn't it it can be because we do take it very seriously because of the work that we're doing we need to get it done we can't disappoint anyone right so we we take it to heart it means a lot to us also the build projects are going to be there far after we're gone so it's you know it's a it's a labor of love that is intended to make a difference for generations right and be there forever so we want to do it right we want to do it well um mm -hmm. and then you know you're obviously traveling and you know to get to zambia africa we took four planes uh had four a, planes four planes had a nine over layover nine 
hour layover. <laughs> See, nine I'm just like now. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> nine hour layover in Qatar, but yeah, we had we had those four planes, and then we had a nine hour bus drive once we got there. So because it was where we were going was in kind of the slums or very remote area mm-hmm. of, of Zambia. Um, so. Yeah, so we were obviously that that's a I think a twelve hour difference. Uh, oh, from Boston, it's not from Boston. I think it's a nine hour difference. Yeah, but from LA, where we are all flying out from, mm-hmm. um, it's a twelve hour difference. So we're jet lagged, and then mm-hmm. we're starting work the next day. We get there, and sometimes we go straight to the site, or we start working the next day um, right away. We're getting up at five thirty in the morning. We're working until about six p.m. Um, sometimes, if we're up against the clock, we're working till ten p.m. And now you have you have only seven days to do all these projects. Is that like a thing? I do. do, or do yeah. Have- so seven days in each country, right? So seven days oh. in one place, and then seven days in the next place, and oh. we have ten weeks to get ten locations done. Are there going to be any upcoming shows? Like what other countries and other places are you going to visit? Yeah, so we're the season is over. So now we're waiting to hear if there will be a fourth season. I really hope so. I hope so. I do. I do think it's a show that changes a lot of lives, whether you are in the communities that we are um, going and helping. I used to be a big fan of the the show Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Oh, yeah? You know, and Uh I I always watch that every week, you know. uh, It's it's fun. It's It's fun to watch the the process of building, you know. Yeah, it's fun to watch the process of building and and, um, creating, I think. Yeah, my father, my father was a bricklayer, you know, he, 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 um, he learned that when he first came to this country, he learned the craft of bricklaying from his friends, you know, and, uh, He's uh he's worked at Fenway Park. He's worked at Harvard University. You know he he retired about 25 years ago. But I mean he's he's um you know he enjoys doing it. He uh, if, if my father was uh, younger again, he probably want to go with you guys to go to. Uh, oh, I'm where, sure. Uh, but anyway. Well, I still I'm still pinching myself. I still can't believe that I get to mix so many of the things that I love from travel and connecting with people and carpentry. You know, into one job. I'm still. Uh, I am very aware of how lucky I am to get to do that yeah. um, and get to, you know, uh, make some sort of, of difference. But also, I am a big believer that we are students of life. Um, mm-hmm. And I, it's such a big learning curve. Anywhere we go, I learn so much. I am filled with reflection and I'm filled with this sense of, of acceptance and joy. And it doesn't matter what culture, it doesn't matter where you are there's so much that we don't know and mm. the more you learn the more you feel you don't know it's mm. such a crazy dichotomy uh, andy <laughs> let me tell you you you've really been a big inspiration from what i've talked to you for this past this past few hours this past hour i mean you you're, oh. you're such an inspiring young person oh, thank and i uh, just want to i ask you uh, what are what are future projects for you what are you going to be doing uh, this year and beyond if you want if Absolutely. you want to um I think so right now we're waiting to hear if there's going to be another season. I really hope there is. I want to be doing this show for a long time mm-hmm. if I can. Um but of course that's outside of our control since there have been three seasons and um like I said it's a show that people uh not just own, not just enjoy watching but also that makes a real tangible difference around the world so that's one reason i really hope it continues um but i'm also doing a lot of producing projects i've i've in my career trajectory i've been a high school teacher as well i was a theater director which led me to direct some theater in the la area i did a play in north hollywood that raised money for uh the good shepherd shelter which is a um uh a safe haven for battered women and children oh. um, or people in uh vulnerable situations oh. and um and that's that that's a big uh, the the play was actually about that so it was like life or art rep- reflecting life mm-hmm. but also making some sort of tangible difference and so i think i want to keep that theme throughout my career um i'm now producing i'm producing to TV shows um, that are in various stages of development, oh, wow. <laughs> um, and so they're in development right now. Um, I just shot a. The reason I'm in Boston, I just shot a film here, mm-hmm. um, which I'm excited about. That should be coming out uh, next year, in a year and a half, maybe, mm. um, depending. But yeah. depending on the festival situation. And so you got quite a lot on your plate right now. Um, 
Yeah, I I try to always have a lot on my plate, but I try not to get married to an end result, right? right? It's all about the journey and the process of creating. So if I'm acting, I am focused on the audition and just doing my best for that audition. And once it's over, letting it go. And then if I'm producing, I am, you know, making sure that this show has the best chance of success with investors or uh, production companies that want to develop it or take it on and finance it. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking and, you know, and, and a lot of that is just engaging with people and believing in what you're doing. So if you believe in yourself as an actor, you're going to give a great audition because you're not believe, you know, you you believe in yourself, you believe in what you're doing. It's going to come across like you're having fun while you're doing mm -hmm. while you're really centered in the moment. At the same time, um, you have to believe in the work. Right. And putting in the work, you have to believe that that you know it's about the process and not the end result because the end result we don't have control over so if you're focused on things you don't have control over you're already in a place of setting yourself up to be disappointed mm. but it's so much more fun not to have control over the end result it's so much more fun to see what happens and be like wow i could never have imagined right when i wrote that post-it no, note i never I could have imagined the fixers yeah. but it was way better than anything i, I could have imagined I know. andy i want to thank you so much for being on the show I mean, no, I, you, 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 me. you, were, you were a very wonderful person, and uh, you're a terrific well. actress, and I want to thank <laughs> you so much from the bottom of my heart for being on the show. No, so. thank you for having me. Thank you. This is an amazing mm. studio, and I mean, it was lovely to meet your team and and seeing you again after so many years. Oh my God! I Being mean, back in Boston, I mean, I I'm know. just so grateful to this this town. It's so, amazing. So, um, well, good luck in for your future plans. I hope the fixtures comes back again. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> keep in touch with me, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Great that's, to see I, you. That's Andy Sweeney Blanco, <laughs> uh, and that's all the time we have for the CVB show. As always. I'm Stevie B. So we'll hopefully see you next time and uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs> Do I clap? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs>